Welcome back everybody. Today we're going over this pistol that you see in my hand right here and that you saw throughout the intro. It is the Smith & Wesson M&P 2.0. Now, a lot of people were really excited about the 2.0 because the M&P uh, is a pistol that has been around for over 10 years now and has had a lot of success. It's a very good gun. Um, I still like the 1.0s, if you will. Um, but a lot of people were excited about this because the M&P did have some shortcomings. One of the more um, exposed or talked about ones was that it had some accuracy issues, particularly at longer distances with skilled shooters. They were having a hard time getting it to group well. Um, and then there were some other things that folks really didn't like. A lot of people said if you buy an MP, you have to get an Apex kit. Well, <laughs> I had several MPs, I'd never got an Apex kit. So you don't have to, that is for sure. But a lot of people felt that way because the triggers uh, just left them wanting something else. So the 2.0 tried to address those issues as well as a couple others. So what we're going to do first is step outside of the range and actually test that accuracy and see what we can get from a rest with this guy here behind it and a few different loads and see basically did they resolve the issue. I know they put a new barrel in there in terms of a 1 in 10 twist and did some different lockup things that we'll get into later. But we'll check it out and uh, of course we're going to let the dogs take a look at it first to make sure it's okay and uh, then get out there and get on with the accuracy test and then come back in kind of go over the differences and what I think of the pistol overall. Sure, many of you watching this are actually watching just to see how the accuracy of the new pistol is because uh, one thing that sort of plagued a lot, not all, but a lot of the uh, MPs, the original generation, if you will, was uh, some accuracy issues. So, we're gonna run four different loads through it today, and uh, we got a target down range at 25 yards, and uh, we'll see what it can do with a couple uh, sort of loads that should be match loads and then a couple different practice loads. So, first up, we have some Fioki 115 grain stuff. So nothing fancy, and uh, we'll see how it does. Blow that down a bit. I should also note that we have uh, the Trijicon HD sights, the new XRs. I put those on there just to make sure we can get uh, really as good a sight picture as we can with irons. So we'll see what it'll do. That's a better group than I was expecting. Let's just put it that way. All right, next up we have some uh, Federal HST. This is the 150, 150 gram load. So heavy for caliber. And we'll see how it'll do. Uh, yeah, just looking at that Fioki load, uh, <laughs> it seems that they've improved, but you know, we got three more loads to go. Uh, Bad at all. All right, next up, we're gonna put some 115 grade munition stuff through there. Total metal jacket load. Uh, those of you guys who have watched them in the past, know this stuff tends to shoot pretty well, although it is technically like, you know, practice ammo. So we'll see what it'll do. I have a piece of brass over here burning my arm. That's great. opened up a little bit, but still pretty good. So, last load we're gonna shoot are some 147 grain uh, loads from Wilson Combat. So this is their match ammo. That worked yet.
All right, let's go check it out. Like you guys saw, it did pretty well there. The Fiocchi load was up first. Right at an inch and three quarters on that one. Then I'm not 100% sure where we went. I think my Alzheimer's is kicking in. Uh, so I think this was the uh, HST, I'm not sure. Um, but that was right at two and a half inches. Then we came over here, I think it was the Minuteman. Right at three inches on the dot. And then uh, down here with the Wilson. We're right at two inches on the dot there, so no mods to the uh, gun at all, with the exception of the sights, so no polished trigger, no nothing, and uh, seems to be doing pretty well. Before getting into the differences between this and the original Gen 1, just kind of want to talk about the pistol on the whole, just some basics of it. This is the model that has the 4.25 inch barrel. They also make a 5 inch barrel. They make them with thumb safeties and without, and they make them currently, I believe, in 9, 45, and 40 in the uh, M&P 2.0 series. So um, that is what you get there. There's definitely um, some things that carry over from the original. Number one, it has a nice nitrided slide. The finish is very good overall. Um, I think the M&Ps have had some of the better finishes for polymer guns out there in terms of metal finish out there in the market. This one here is no exception. Uh, the basic overview of how the gun works is the same. Of course, it is a strike fire gun. So, you know, pull the trigger, it should go bang. If not, cycle the action, and uh, it will, at least with the next round. So basic operation is the same. Uh, the sights themselves are the same, so that is good. So there's a ton of different aftermarket sights available for these, and there's no exception there um, in terms of this one versus the early. If it works on one of them, it'll work on the other, so that's certainly good. The gun comes with... Um, Two different magazines. They have good mags overall, hold 17 rounds for a total of 17 plus one capacity for the firearm itself. And one thing that is different, but the same, I guess it's sort of both, is that the new uh, 2.0s come with three different back straps in, in addition to the one on there for a total of four. And the originals came with two additional plus the one on there for a total of three. So it gives you a little bit more um, fit options, if you will, to fit the grip to your hand. So with that, I suppose we'll go over the actual differences between the two models and just kind of knock that out as best we can. I actually have three different M&P 9s from the, uh, we'll call them the 1.0 for the rest of the video anyway. Um, the reason is my wife used to carry one, so that one was sort of off limits. I had one that I used to shoot a lot and then sort of got an extra one on a good deal. This is actually the most recent one. This one here is made in uh, late 2015, so it has all of these sort of current options that are available for the M&P 1.0 series. And I'll say that because we'll get into why that's kind of important here in just a second. So uh, just kind of the biggest difference that you see overall from the user interface is the grip texturing. It's not even close. So I, as many folks who watch the channel here know, am a huge fan of aggressive texturing on guns. Uh, where I shoot here, it's Carolina and eight months out of the year, it's extremely hot and your hands are sweating and guns that slip around in your hand tend to not do well with follow-up shots. So I definitely much prefer, without question, the new grip texturing here on the 2.0. It's uh, it's good that it sticks to your hands, but it's not so abrasive that it's going to hurt if you're actually shooting long firing strings. It's, at least in my experience anyway, not going to uh, rip and shred your clothes like some of the really aggressive guns out there will do. I didn't experience any of that, and we wore it around for several different range days, in and out of the car, all that stuff, rubbing against clothing, and saw no ill effects there. So the grip texture, in my opinion, again, big plus for the M&P 2.0. One thing that's also different is, of course, you can see the logos here on the bottom. The 1.0, if you will, has the Smith & Wesson logo, and then over here we have the M&P. But one thing that's nice, and there's a nice addition to it, is that they have this little cutout here on the magwell. And what that's for is uh, so that you can rip your magazines out. So if you have a double feed, you can get a better grip on the actual magazine to rip it out and then clear your malfunction. Whereas on the Gen 1, it, it's actually kind of flared out. I think you can kind of see it if you look at it. It's actually flared out. It actually does the exact opposite of that. It makes it harder to grab onto the magazine. So that's one of the subtle changes for sure. 
Another big difference is that there's steel now extending all the way forward in the frame. So it's steel reinforcements going all the way forward. So before the sort of steel insert of the frame, if you will, kind of was from here to here on the actual M&P pistols. Whereas now it goes all the way out to basically this line right here where those steel inserts are. And uh, anybody who's ever watched sort of like a really high speed video of say a Glock, for example, firing will know that the gun in the frame actually torque a little bit under recoil. And what Smith & Wesson was trying to do was sort of uh, shore, shore that up, if you will, make it a little bit more stronger, a little more rigid under recoil, I'm guessing, to help improve with accuracy. Um, like we saw, the accuracy is certainly fine. There's some other changes that they did as well, which we'll get into here a little bit later on, but that is one of them. One thing you also see that's different is these forward serrations. However, in my opinion, these are completely for looks and not functional at all. Uh, the reason I say that is if you can kind of look down at the gun, one thing you'll notice is that right behind those serrations is this sort of hump here in the frame where it goes out and gets wider. So if you actually tried to use those, your fingers hit that. So there's really almost no way you can, I mean, I guess you kind of could press check with it, but any sort of manipulations or anything like that with the front of the slide, there's, there's no advantage to it because your fingers are going to immediately hit that beefy part there on the frame itself. So uh, maybe it looks cool, but certainly not functional. Early generations of the M&Ps had a real big problem with the auto forwarding. So what I mean by that is when you insert a magazine into the gun, the slide will automatically go forward. My oldest one has that issue, if you will. I don't really see it as a huge issue, but it can be an issue that's not optimal. With the 2.0, you can see we absolutely reinforced that. Our Smith & Wesson did not we. They reinforced the uh, slide release and the slide lock there. It's got this extra piece here that sort of puts tension on it and makes it much more difficult to actually go home. So it also catches here on the slide in a little bit beefier way than it would on the old uh, 1.0, if you will. So the pro of that is there's just no way I could really see it auto forwarding. The con of it is that it's a little bit harder to manipulate. Now with your strong hand, it's perfectly fine. Uh, but when you try to do weak hand uh, dropping it, it can be a little bit difficult. It's doable, but you really got to make a purpose of it. And I have really large hands. Um, so I think somebody with smaller hands may have a harder time doing that. Just sort of a pro and a con there. A lot of people think it's only a pro. And I mean, I, I think it depends. It could be both. Field stripping the gun is the same in both the Gen 1 and Gen 2 or 2.0 and 1.0. You can see the pistol is clear at this point. We're going to rotate our lever, lever down, let it go home. You can also uh, push forward the sear disconnect, which is the yellow lever in there if you don't want to pull the trigger. But at that point, you can pull the trigger and the slide will come off. Now, one thing that I think a lot of people sort of miss when they compare the two pistols and the differences between the two is that the slides are actually a little bit different. And some Kydex holsters, from what I understand, uh, for the 2.0 won't fit the 1.0 for exactly that reason. If you take a look here, the 1.0 is wider in the slide than the 2.0 is. So there's just more material relieved once we start sort of cutting material out here on the slides. And you can absolutely see it when you look at them side by side. Um, not a huge difference, but it is something to point out there. However, the weight on the two pistols is still almost identical. On my scale, with no magazine, the 1.0 weighed one pound, eight ounces, or eight points, 8.6 ounces. This one here, the 2.0 weighed one pound, 8.8 8 .8 ounces. So 0 0.02 ounces of difference. So almost nothing. So even though the slide is lighter, I think the extra steel there in the frame is probably what the difference is, making them almost identical. So that is the disassembly process you'll see there. Uh, and M&Ps have been doing this really since right after the first um, generation of guns, if you will. So they've been making these little marks in the slide to identify the run they come from and basically how the barrel lockup works. So here on the 2.0, you'll notice some differences here in the barrel versus the one. So try to keep these separated. And so I actually know the difference, but you can see down there on the barrel where it locks up some of the early, let me focus my camera here. Some of the early ones didn't have this little circle ring there um, at all, though this is the later, of course, of the 1.0 and it does have it, but you can see it's different in terms of size. I'm not sure if that really comes across well on camera, but it's a little bit more radius here on the 2.0. Uh, additionally, the barrel hoods are very different. Again, if you take a look there, how they lock up in the actual angle of it, it is different. Same thing here on the bottom. You'll see that the, the lug here, again, if my camera will actually focus, 
has that sort of chamfer to it, which the 1.0 here doesn't. So there absolutely are differences in the way they designed the barrel to walk up. In my opinion, that is, again, to address the accuracy issues that plagued the 1.0 version. So we'll put the pistol back together and get on with it. Another big visual difference for the two guns is that the 1.0 here has the beaver tail, which is exaggerated out. And here on the 2.0, it does not have that. Um, I kind of like the beaver tail personally. I don't really miss it when I'm firing the uh, 2.0 but it's just something to note there. It does kind of allow you to really jam your hand in there. And if you have kind of fat, beefy hands, it prevents that slide from uh, doing any slide bite on you. But uh, like I said earlier, the sights are the same. They have Novak style sights from the factory. Um, they're okay sights. Uh, they're not bad. They're just like these. These are factory night sights. So that is sort of how they come. They're certainly usable three dot sights, much better than say like Glock sights, for example. But we went with the uh, new Trigicon HDs this is the XR version that has the thinner uh, front, front uh, post there. That front post there is only 0.122 wide. Now I have a full review on the Trigicon HDs, really like them. But one of the complaints people had of them was that it was there wasn't enough sort of space between when you look through that U-notch there on the rear to sort of get it lined up perfectly and for really good accuracy it was hindering it so Trigicon came out with this version here with the thinner front post i will do a full review of those but we got those in and uh, we've been running them this gun that's what we use for the action test as you guys saw and i really do like them it definitely is a very good sight picture it's quick but still allows you the precision that some folks will want as well so it's good balance there of the two. Earlier I mentioned that some holsters might not work and one that I know works for sure is this Gearcraft holster. Of course I ordered it for the MNP 2.0 but this one here is designed to work with a TLR 1HL. It's got kind of a cool cryptic, cryptic pattern on there. That's me writing that on there. That's not them. It won't come like that if you order it but that's just a reminder for myself but I do like it. Good outside the waistband rig. Uh, it's solid good fit, good burnishing around the edges. So I always like to mention that because I know you guys ask about what holsters I'm using if I don't mention it in the videos. So that is what we're using here throughout the video. One thing that the 1.0 pistols never really got questioned on was the reliability. They're generally considered pretty reliable guns. That was my experience with them. I never really had any reliability issues with them at all. I'm sure I had a malfunction here and there, but I put a lot of rounds through them over the years. And again, generally very, very reliable pistols. This one here seems to be following uh, along those lines as well. I've had zero malfunctions with it over Overall, several hundred rounds through it at this point, and uh, both hollow point, full metal jacket, different weights. Um, of course, the majority was the Minuteman 115 grain, but absolutely zero issues out of it at all. So happy to report that for sure. Uh, the MP is just a very good gun overall. It has a lot that people were sort of always looking for, right? So the Glock was in still as king of the hill in terms of polymer pistols, but there's a lot of guns coming out today, polymer striker fired guns that really are legitimate and contenders for it and uh, absolutely can compete in all the different metrics with it. The MNP was one of them. This one here is an improvement on the original in my opinion in just about every way. Um, so good accuracy, good reliability, it points well, it feels good in the hand. It has that, I think they have an 18 degree grip angle that a lot of guys really like. Um, for me, um, I'm so used to shooting Glocks that it does take me a little bit of getting used to it to get on target. But I think someone who never shot a Glock, and if they were you know, coming of age in today's world, I think they would find Glock ergonomics very um, poor, in my opinion, and something like this would be a much more desirable option for them. So it definitely has good ergonomics, good controls. Um, it's generally speaking lefty friendly with a reversible mag release. It's not fully ambidextrous, but that has, does have the slide lock and slide stop that we talked about earlier. And again, reliable gun, boringly reliable, so that's certainly a good thing. Another good thing is the price point on them. Um, they're not overly expensive. The 2.0s, if you look around today, are generally speaking, I think MSRP $50 more than the uh, 1.0s. But out there on the market, you know, they're generally about $100 more because the 1.0s have dropped down in price. So just usually see these for the 450 to 550 range depending on which model and what the features are that it comes with so it's an affordable gun in line with a lot of other quality polymer striker fire guns so that's a good thing it has going forward as well um sort of overall what's my take well you guys got a lot of it right there but my thought on this was somebody like me who already has the 1.0 um should you go out and rush and buy this 2.0 Probably not. In my opinion, the 1.0 is still a good gun. And one thing I didn't touch on, and I just realized it now, is the trigger. Everybody wants to know the trigger. So uh, the trigger, in my opinion, if you look at the early pistols, um, is a huge improvement over the early 1.0s. But over the later ones, like the one that you guys saw throughout this video, I don't really know that there's any improvement at all. So um, with that, we have the actual take up there with that hinge trigger. 
which is kind of just mushy and that's fine. But once we get to the wall, the brake's not super crisp. It's not terrible. Um, there's a little bit of slop in there. And then the reset, it's a little bit longer than some. It is audible, it is tactile. So again, versus the early M&Ps, it's light years better, 10 times better. But versus the later ones, it's pretty similar. I don't notice a dramatic improvement. It breaks right around six pounds on my scale. Um, and it's not super crisp, not super clean. It's not gonna compete with like a HK VP9, a Canik TP9 SF, uh, Walther PPQ. It's not on that level, um, but it's, perfectly usable in my opinion like you guys saw it there during that accuracy test i had no problems with it but lots of folks still want to drop those apex kits in if that's you have at it because i don't think it's a, again a dramatic improvement over the later 1.0 so that is one thing to point out but um again if i had a 1.0 and it was you know had all the current upgrades to it would i rush out and buy this probably not um, that said, I would, if I was looking at an M&P, I would absolutely buy this. I definitely, for me alone, the grip texture is really worth it. It just feels great in the hand. And I really do like that. Of course, you could also get some like Talon grip tape and throw that on the 1.0 and you'd be mostly there. So if you see a really good deal on a 1.0, I'd probably, you know, I'd think about it, put it that way. Uh, cause the performance differences aren't really that huge in my opinion. So it's a good gun. It's an improvement. I like it. Um, I just don't know that it's a radical improvement, if you will. It's sort of Gen 4 Glock versus Gen 3 Glock. Most people like it, but not a huge difference. And I still shoot Gen 3 Glocks all the time. I imagine the M&P 1.0 will be the same. So that sums it up. If you guys have any questions about the gun, anything like that, you can always post down below in the comment section. You can also post over at my Facebook page as always. That generally speaking is the best way to get in touch with me because I don't always see the comments here on YouTube anymore with their new system. So I think that'll wrap it up. Thanks for watching guys. Thanks for subscribing. If you're not subscribed and you just found this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and we'll see y'all in the next video.